Paul is writing to the Romans concerning the gospel of God. The word gospel in English meant good spell. It means good news, the good news of God. And that gospel of God that Paul writes to the Romans is concerning the grace of God for us. And surely God's grace is good news. Now it is concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, who was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. And as we pointed out to you last week, God had promised to David that he would build him a house by which David understood that the Messiah was to come from his seed. And in Matthew's Gospel, we have Joseph's lineage traced back to David through Solomon. In Luke's Gospel, we have Mary's lineage traced back to David through David's older son, Nathan. The reason why both lineages are placed in the scripture, even though Joseph was not the father of Jesus, Jesus became the oldest son of Joseph by adoption. And because he came through Solomon, he had the right as king of Israel. With the exception that one of those relatives in the background of Joseph, Jochanias, was cursed by God in the book of Jeremiah that not a seed of his should sit upon the throne of Israel forever. Now, Nathan was the older brother of Solomon, really had a more of a right to the throne than did Solomon. Mary came from David through Nathan, that older son, and Luke's traces the lineage of Mary on down. But God got around the difficulty. His son is king of Israel. He will be sitting upon the throne of David when he comes to establish his kingdom and when he does he will have actually a right by lineage the seed of David according to the flesh but he's declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness now, when Jesus was baptized, God declared him to be his son. God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Declared to be the son of God. Again, when Jesus was transfigured before his disciples, Again, God spoke from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. So God declared him to be his Son. Jesus himself declared that he was the Son of God. In fact, in John's Gospel, we find how the Jews resented his claim. And in the Greek tense, it is because he was continually claiming to be the Son of God. They were going to stone him. He's declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness. God's Spirit bearing witness as to whom he is but then also declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Now we are told that if that same Spirit 
that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us. He also is going to quicken our bodies, make alive our bodies. Now, notice here he is declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. It didn't say by his resurrection from the dead, but by the resurrection from the dead. And by his resurrecting the dead, he is declared to be the Son of God with power. Not only did Jesus rise from the dead, but all of those who believe in him will he also raise from the dead. In fact, he said, if you live and believe in him, you will never die. Matthew's gospel tells us that at the time of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, many of the graves of the saints were open and they were seen walking through the streets of Jerusalem. He was declared to be the Son of God with power because of the resurrection, His power to resurrect those who are dead. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. He who lives and believes in me shall never die. Those who believed in him, when he ascended, they ascended with him. They rose from the dead, from among the dead, actually, at his resurrection. Paul tells us in Ephesians 4, He who has ascended is the same one who first of all descended into the lower parts of the earth. And when he ascended, he led the captives from their captivity. He that believes on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And if you live and believe in me, you will never die. So he's declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. By whom? we have received grace and apostleship. Paul the Apostle had received the grace of God. He refers to himself one place as the chiefest of sinners. And this is sort of a paradox. Because though he said that he was the chiefest of sinners, yet as far as the righteousness which was from the law, he was blameless. Now how can you be blameless as far as the righteousness which is from the law and in the same token be the chief of sinners? Because the word sinner means missing the mark. And if you're trying to be accepted before God by keeping the law, you're missing the mark. And the harder you try, the further you are missing the mark. God will not accept your righteousness, your works. They are as filthy rags in His eyes. God gave us the law not to make us righteous, but to drive us in desperation to Jesus Christ, realizing that there is no way that I can have a righteous standing before God by my works. The law was given that it might make sin exceedingly sinful. Now, by the misinterpreting of the law, which the Jews had done, they were hoping that by the law they could attain a righteous standing before God. And in their endeavor to be accepted by God by their works, they were missing the mark. Sinning. And so Paul says, I was the chiefest of sinners. I missed the mark more than any of the rest of them. And it is interesting, he was missing the mark while in his heart he was trying to hit the mark. Being zealous towards God as far as the law was concerned. Yet, 
By the law is no man justified before God. We have almost incorporated within our whole thinking processes the rewards for goodness concept. If you're a good little boy, you'll get a gold star. And, and this reward for goodness concept is inbred within us. Now, that's fine, that's good as far as our relationship perhaps with each other, but not when it comes to our relationship with God. God does not reward me with salvation because I am good, because I've done a good job, because I've done a good work for Him. God's gift is eternal life. And it is not of works, lest any man should boast. So that we must recognize the only standing that we can have before God is through God's grace. His unmerited favor to me. I have not earned my salvation. I am not earning my salvation. It is God's gift of grace to me. And Paul is going to develop this whole theme as we get into Romans. Showing us that our only hope of standing before God is through grace, not through work. So, Paul had received, first of all, grace. Secondly, apostleship. Now, in the first verse, he speaks about he was called an apostle as he was separated to the gospel of God. And now he makes mention again of his apostleship. By whom we have received this grace and apostleship. Now, the purpose of the ministry, Paul's apostleship, was to bring people to the obedience of faith, to obey the promises of God, to believe, to bring them to that faith, the obedience of faith. Now, faith, true faith, is manifested by its obedience. You see, I'm saved by grace through faith. But a true faith will produce obedience in my life. If I have a real faith, then my actions are going to correspond with that faith. There are many people who have a professed faith. They can say the words. They know the jargon. But theirs is not a true faith because their life itself is not in harmony with what they profess themselves to believe. If I believed that this building had been booby-trapped tonight and that under the pulpit here there was ten tons of dynamite set to go off at 8.15 and I really believe that was so. I really believe that, you know, they were 8.15, they were going to trigger it. And this whole place was going to come smashing down. And if I stood up here and said, folks, 8.15 tonight, this whole place is going to go. Things been booby-trapped. 
This whole place is just going to be blown to bits. And I just went on talking, not doing anything about it, not responding in such a way as to correspond with what I said I believed. You, you would say, well, he really doesn't believe that. Why? Because my actions don't correspond. If I was up here to say, hey, folks, <laughs> A15, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I say, get out of here, and I go tearing out. Then you say, he really believes it. Because now his actions are corresponding with his profession. Now, it is important that when we say that we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and that He is coming soon to take the righteous, His church, out of the earth, if our actions of life do not correspond with what we say we believe, then there is a great reason to doubt whether or not we truly believe it. We may believe that there is a possibility. We may believe that there is a chance that it, but we don't have that deep, strong conviction of really believing what we say, what we're professing. For when you truly believe what you are professing, then there will be a harmony with your actions. They will correspond with what you say that you believe. So Paul was sent to bring people into the obedience of faith, not just the faith in Christ, but to a faith that would produce an obedience to God and to God's Word. James said, you say you believe God? Doesn't do much. The devils believe in God. They fear and tremble before him. It's more than mentally assenting to certain creeds. Believing in your heart, Paul said, which will produce a changed attitude and action in your life. So he was sent to bring obedience to the faith. The scope of his ministry was to all nations. Now Paul at this point had not yet been to Rome but was yearning in his heart to go to Rome and had been assured by the Spirit that he was going to make it to Rome. But this gospel that Paul had to proclaim was a gospel that wasn't limited to one ethnic group of people, but it was a gospel that was to all the world, to all ethnos. The word, the word here translated nations is ethnos, all ethnic groups. doesn't matter what your ethnic background may be. This good news of God is for you. And then the motive of his apostleship was for his name. For, for the sake of Jesus Christ, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called saints. So he says three things here about the believers. First of all, you were called by Jesus Christ. Whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate. And those whom he did predestinate, he did also call. 
you've been called of Jesus Christ. Called to be what? You've been called to be a saint. Called of Jesus Christ to all that be in Rome who are beloved of God. What a beautiful phrase that is, beloved of God. Oh, if we only knew, if we could only comprehend the vast depth of God's love for us. God calls us his beloved. You're beloved of God. That's a, that's a special term that you'll find in the Bible that's reserved for those who are just really special people, those that are close to God. And God considers you a special person. And he calls you beloved. God's cry to the nation Israel was for the unrequited love. He speaks of the great love that he had for them, of the yearning that he had for them, of all that he did for them to demonstrate his love, and yet they would not reciprocate, they would not return, but they turned to other lovers, and they turned away from him. And their heart was after other things, not after God. Now, God loves you, and His heart is after you. He loves you so much, He's thinking about you all the time. David said, if I should number the thoughts concerning me, they are more than the sands of the sea. Oh God, if I should, if I should try to count how many times you're thinking about me, it would be more than the sands of the sea. God calls you his beloved because he loves you. He's thinking about you all the time. Now, in the same token, he wants you to respond with a love towards him. He wants you to be th thinking about him all the time. But so many times as God comes to receive that love and that fellowship from us, he finds our hearts turning after other things. Oh, Lord, I, I, I would really love to spend some time with you today, but, oh, I've got this project going, God, and I just don't have time. Now, if you could come back next Tuesday at 3 in the afternoon, I, I think I could work you in for 10 minutes or so. And yet his thoughts towards us, if I should number them, they are more than the sands of the sea. But again, what a tragic thing. Here he is, the creator of this whole vast universe. The giver and sustainer of life. And yet it seems that he is always yearning for love, which comes back to him too seldom, too little. God help us. God help us to respond more to him, to just spend more time loving him, worshiping him, telling him how much we love him, thinking about him, and expressing our love to him. You've been called of Jesus Christ, and you are beloved of God, and then called saints. Who called you saints? God did. Now, the word to be, you'll notice, is in italics. That means that it isn't in the Greek. In the Greek, it just says you've been called saints. God calls you a saint. Well, how can God call me a saint? My wife doesn't. And if you'd follow me around a while, you wouldn't either. <laughs> but God does. 
Now, as we move along in the book of Romans, we're going to find an interesting characteristic of God in his prekenosis so that because he knows a thing is going to be, he is able to call it and speak of it as though it existed even though it does not yet exist because he knows it's going to exist. You see, God is not limited in our time zone. God is outside of our time zone. And being outside of our time zone, he can see the end from the beginning. And God sees his finished work in your life, that complete work in your life. And the beautiful thing is, is that as God beholds me today, he beholds me in that righteousness that has been imparted and imputed to me by Jesus Christ. And he sees me as complete in Christ. And in that completed state in Christ, I am a saint. So he calls me a saint. Now, it is tragic that the historic church reserved that title for just special persons with outstanding deeds. Because God didn't reserve that title for just special persons. He has given that title to all that he has called to follow him. If you're a child of God tonight, God sees you in the perfected, complete state in Christ Jesus, and as such, he calls you his saints. Now, this is one of those things, if someone else calls you that, if God calls you that, it's all right. It's, it's a title you don't take to yourself, though. You know, there's a lot of things that if people call you that, that's all right. If they want to call you that, but it's, it, it's, there are certain titles you just shouldn't take for yourself. And saint is one of those titles. <laughs> as long as God has called me a saint, that's all right. I'll accept that. But there are many people going around, you know, trying to claim sainthood on their own. Doesn't work. To all that are in Rome who are beloved of God, called saints, grace to you and peace from God. Grace was the common greeting of the Greeks. And peace was the common greeting of the Hebrews. You go to Israel today and uh, meeting someone on the street, uh, you say, Shalom. And they say, Shalom, Shalom. And, and it's just a common greeting. It, it's the word that they use for it's just peace. Shalom. Well, the, in the Greek society and culture, their common greeting was charis. Grace. Grace. Beautiful word. It's a word that spoke of beauty, of favor, favored with beauty. And it was a very common greeting, but it is a greeting that really takes on real meaning when it is put into the Christian framework. Grace. God's unmerited favor to you. Followed by peace. Now, these 
are called the Siamese twins of the New Testament because they are usually coupled together in the greetings. And they are always in this order. Never once do you read peace and grace be unto you because that would be the wrong order. You cannot really know the peace of God until you have received and understand and experience the grace of God. I spent the first half of my ministry not really knowing the grace of God and thus never having the peace of God. It was not until I studied the book of Romans and the Holy Spirit brought me into an understanding of the grace of God that I then began to experience the glorious peace of God. For years I sought to please God by my devotion to Him. I sought to have an acceptable standing before God, an acceptance by God, by my fervor and my dedication. I was going out into the wilderness fasting. I was going through all kinds of things, trying to please God, trying to get my mind off of my flesh and onto things of the Spirit. And I found that the more I sought to live after the Spirit, the stronger the battle I had in my flesh. And I was aware of my failures. And I was constantly weeping before God, repenting. Well, I don't suppose it was repenting because I was doing the same thing over, but I was telling Him I was sorry wanting to repent, wanting to change, but couldn't find the way to change. And my Christian experience was one of turmoil. And I didn't know from one day to the next if I was really saved. Always making a new commitment, always making new promises new vows, and I had no real peace of God within my heart and life because I didn't know the grace of God. I was trying to be accepted on the basis of my goodness and my works, my obedience, my dedication, my commitment. Some people speak of the day that they accepted Jesus Christ as the greatest experience in their whole Christian walk. Do you know I can't even remember the day I accepted Jesus Christ? In fact, I don't even remember a day when I didn't believe in Jesus Christ. I grew up believing in Jesus Christ. from my earliest abilities to talk. My mother started teaching me scriptures and I started memorizing scriptures when I was first able to talk. There was never a time when I didn't 
believe and know that Jesus was my Savior, that he died for my sins. So I, I, I can't say that the day I accepted Jesus Christ was the, the most exciting day in my life because I don't even remember when it happened. Some people say, oh, the day I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, that was the most glorious day of my Christian walk. Well, to me, it was a very glorious day. Because at that time, Jesus became the Lord of my life. And I submitted myself to serve him at that time. Up until then, I have my own ambitions, my own goals, my own dreams, what I was going to be, what I was going to do. But there I turned my life over to Jesus Christ, and that was a glorious experience. I'm, I never regretted it. But do you know what the most glorious day is in my Christian experience? is the day that I discovered the grace of God and I ceased from my own labors and I entered into the rest of the finished work of Jesus Christ. That was the most glorious day in my whole Christian experience, the day I discovered God's grace towards me. Because up until then, I had always had a rocky relationship with God. Though I was in the ministry, serving the Lord, yet I was never really sure of my salvation until I discovered God's grace. Now, my salvation was sure, but I wasn't sure of it. <laughs> And the day I became assured by the grace of God, I ceased from my labors and I experienced the peace of God and of Jesus Christ. But you have to know the grace before you can have the peace. Now tonight I am resting in Jesus Christ. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by His grace. I'm resting in His grace. I have that glorious peace that God has accepted me. And it is God's work for me which counts, not my feeble efforts for Him. You say, oh, then did you quit serving the Lord? No, I think I serve the Lord more now than I ever did before. But I don't look at it as giving me credits anywhere. I serve him now out of a heart of love. You know, woe is me if I preach not the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul's typical greeting of grace and peace, but they need to become more than just words of greeting. They need to become the practical experience of our Christian life where I truly experience the grace of God and I begin to understand that grace of God and how it relates to me and how it affects me so that I can begin to know the peace of God within my life. Grace and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in thus putting God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ together in this way shows the deity of Christ and that of co-equal with God. There are many people today who have a problem with the deity of Jesus Christ. 
Those problems are usually created by man, not by the Word of God. But it would be blasphemous to join the Father with Jesus Christ in such a greeting if they were not co-equal. To say grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, coupling them and joining them together like that would be absolutely wrong if Jesus were not God. Coexistent, co-eternal, co-equal with the Father. Again, the Lord Jesus Christ is a phrase that we will find often through the book of Romans. It is a phrase in which his names are used along with his title. The title is Lord. There probably should be a comma after that so we could distinguish it better in our minds and not think of Lord as a name but as a title and thus be reminded of our relationship to him and this of going back to the obedience of faith. If he is the Lord, then I must be obedient to him. Because then I am the servant. He is the master. I am the servant. I am the slave. Our Lord, Jesus Christ. I mentioned that I cannot remember a time in my life when Jesus wasn't my Savior but I do remember the time in my life when I submitted to him as my Lord. Now many of you have claimed him as your Savior. The question is, have you submitted to him as your Lord? Can you in all honesty tonight say Jesus is Lord as you make that statement can you make it with all sincerity and honesty in your heart do your actions correspond with that statement as you look back over your life this past week would there be conflict with that statement tonight Jesus is my Lord. Think about that for a moment. Is your life living in consistency with that? Because to say it is not enough. Many will come in that day saying, Lord, Lord. You see, he said, not all who say, Lord, Lord, are going to even enter into the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever does the will of the Father. So not only should I be saying Jesus Christ is Lord, but my Actions should harmonize with that phrase so that there would be no glaring inconsistency between what I am saying and in what is in reality proved by my actions and my deeds. Jesus Christ is Lord. May the Holy Spirit tonight do his work within our hearts showing us where we have failed to submit ourselves to that Lordship of Jesus. Where that claim is violated by our activities, by our actions. 
Now, if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. See, that's part of the salvation plan. But it goes on, and believe in your heart. That is where your actions come along and correspond with what you've confessed with your mouth. Then you'll be saved. Jesus Christ is Lord. Is it true? Is it backed up by the way you're living? Therefore, let a man examine himself, for we will judge ourselves, we will not be judged of God. Shall we pray? Lord, keep us, we pray, from self-deception, fooling ourselves with the things our mouth says. For if any man says that he is in the light, yet he walks in darkness, he doesn't know the truth. If we say we have not sinned, we're only deceiving ourselves. If we say that we abide in you, and yet we're not walking as you walked, we're not telling the truth. If we say that we love God, and yet we hate our brother, we're lying. If we say that Jesus is Lord and yet we live and walk after our flesh, we've only deceived ourselves. The truth is not in us. God, we don't want to live in deception. May thy Holy Spirit bring your truth to our hearts tonight that our lives might be in perfect consistency with our professions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want you to all say, Jesus is Lord. Shall we say it together? Jesus is Lord. Now think about that for a moment. Was that an honest statement? Is that true? As far as you personally are concerned? It's important that we make certain of it now. There will come a day when many people who have been making that statement are going to be knocking at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. How come we're not in the kingdom? Lord, we were in church. Lord, we read our Bibles. Lord, we sang the songs. And he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. You see, there wasn't the obedience of faith, which truly testifies to the Lordship. It's serious business. It's life or death. Your life or death. And I wouldn't want to be a false prophet giving to you a false security, causing you to believe that you can live however you please, indulging in your flesh, and just because you have repeated a creed or said certain words that everything is all right. 
Not all who say, Lord, Lord, are going to enter, but those who do the will of the Father, those who have the obedience of faith. May the Holy Spirit just take and help us now as we go from here in the light of the Word of God. And may He point out to us those places where we are walking after our flesh that we might bring them to the cross and submit ourselves fully and completely to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We're going to be getting heavy, heavy, heavy into grace. But there are many people who have, as Peter said, twisted the teaching of grace to use it as a cloak to cover their own evilness. God never intended it to be that. And if you're trying to do that, you're only again deceiving yourself. The grace of God is the most glorious thing I ever discovered. Transform my whole relationship with God. And I'm praying that you'll discover the grace of God in truth and that it will transform your whole relationship with God. But grace is not a license that God gives to you to sin. We're not selling indulgences. You still cannot get away from what Jesus said. Be ye perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. But you see, through that grace and through the Spirit, He gives us the power to be what He requires us to be. But don't be satisfied with anything less. Now may the Lord be with you and may the Lord just instruct you in His way and lead you in His path and cause you to experience more and more of his love, reciprocating it, of his grace, reveling in it, and of his peace, resting in it.